this on over to you. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks to the MRC, to Lisa and Katie and the whole team over there. Uh, yeah, we have a really fun update. Uh, this is kind of nice. We've talked a little bit about this over the past couple of years and different uh, events at uh, different symposiums. If anyone caught the IRL symposium, the three-minute talk, uh, this will be a this will be a lot longer, which will be great. And I really look forward to the questions from everybody. And it's wonderful to see we have 33 participants in the chat right now. Um, we're going to get started with the PowerPoint presentation. I will kick this off with a little PowerPoint. I'm going to jump from the PowerPoint presentation into what's uh, called a story map. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll probably go back to the PowerPoint, look at some pictures, uh, talk in more detail about specific aspects of the project with a little overview. And then hopefully the questions from everyone, since there's 34 of you now, uh, will allow us to kind of dive a little deeper into what you're interested in about the project. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you, screen two. And we did try this earlier, so it should work really smoothly. All right, so we are sharing screen. And does that um, look good to you, Caitlin? Is that, does that look good? I'm trying to see if that's working. It's looking good, you're all good. Okay, great. All right, so this is our Samson's Island Submerged Lands Restoration, Sizzler Project Update. Um, we're going to talk about the history, uh, history of the project, history of the area, why we chose the site. We're going to talk about the implementation of the project, how that was uh, achieved in phase one and in phase two. We'll talk about the eco tours that predated the project uh, and that are currently a way that we're engaging the community in the project itself. Talk about monitoring, both community science monitoring, as well as project monitoring from the partners and the city of Satellite Beach. We're going to talk about stewardship because, as was mentioned in the intro, that is that is my main focus. I believe very, very much in stewardship and in what everybody can do as an individual and what we can do together and how important it is to take that little bit of responsibility and turn it into action. So we're gonna look at the history. So I found a nice map from the internet. Thank you, Google, for you know having such a wide variety of maps, just to kind of give us an idea of the history and the formation of Florida. So um, usually on eco tour that we give, I narrate um, a little bit about the history because I feel like it's important to know where we are in the context of time and place. So Florida created over three to five million years of alluvial deposition. So when we look at this map, for example, you can see the nice little mountains to the north uh, in what is now Georgia. And those Blue Ridge Mountains, you know, are some of the oldest mountains on the planet. When the continents split and drifted and that material that was on those mountains began to deposit itself in what was the Okefenokee Swamps in the north parts of Florida, it was ocean currents that moved a lot of that material around and deposited it on top of what was and is the limestone aquifer system of Florida. So that limestone aquifer system took millennia to be formed over the bones of fish and different organisms, which eventually creates what we now have today is the Florida aquifer system. And built on that, that alluvial material from the mountains began to fill it in. And now you have sea level rise happening in anywhere between 12 to 26 to 32,000 year periods over those 3 million years where sea level was rising and falling and rising and falling, creating coastlines and eroding them. And it's the mangroves um, that, again, thank you MRC for continuing the mangrove propagation and plantings around the, the county and the area. And it's those mangroves that are one of the keystone species that help form some of those first little islands and create the state of Florida. And the mangroves, red mangroves, black mangroves, white mangroves, specifically the red and the black, do a really great job of acquiring, accumulating sediments and materials and building little islands. And we can see that today uh, is very evident in our own Indian River Lagoon ecosystem now. So we'll kind of jump forward a little bit. Here we go. Um, this was a 
project map that I sent in for our Sizzler phase one, where we have the location there in Satellite Beach, just in the southwest corner of Sampson's Island. For context, we're looking at the east coast of Florida. You can see Cape Canaveral up there and Merritt Island swooping down. We are in the Banana River, so we are between a barrier island, Satellite Beach, and a barrier island, Merritt Island, before the mainland. So this pocket of this area um, was wonderful for creating a project because we wanted to find somewhere that was, of course, within the city, in this case, the DEP Aquatic Preserves, and manageable, close, and protected. So it has a lot of protection from mangrove fringe that exists uh, on Sampson's Island. You can see right here, 52 acres of uh, preserve. The story of Sampson's Island is, is wonderful, and I encourage you all to come out and join us for some of our eco tours where you could get on the boat at the fire station and come out and tour around this island and actually walk the over mile of nature trails. You can see these little creeks that run through the island. And basically the wave energy on site is limited by Merritt Island itself and uh, to the west and Sampson's Island, of course, to the east of the project site. So this project site you can see has the green and the um, kind of clam colored um, area there. So the green represents the seagrasses, the clams represented by that pale orange color. And then the perimeter of it is where the oyster breakwaters are. And I'm going to get into a little more detail of that in a minute. Um, so basically, it was location, location, location. You can also see on this map the flats areas extend. So we looked at the sediments on site. We had those tested by UF and FIT. And it's a nice sand. It's a good um, you know, alluvial sand that probably was deposited on the island, which then eroded off over you know, many years. Uh, since its construction, and we can kind of look at that by looking at some historical photos. So these historical photos on the left and on the right, you can see that's uh, 1943 on the left and 58 on the right. So back in the day before it was settled, this is what the island looked like. And you could see little beaches there on Merritt Island. Um, you could see no Grand Canal was present. There were some natural ephemeral creeks and, and, and water bodies that moved through, but nothing as it is today. So this whole area was man-made and engineered uh, to create one of the most beautiful places on earth, in my opinion. And you can see that in 58, they have dug the canal out. Some of the main roads are in, some of the houses are in. Um, the base housing is going in. Uh, that's Lake Shepherd, that big square to the top. And they removed a lot of natural vegetation to make this happen, creating the, um, the Grand Canal system and the finger canals in Satellite Beach, taking that material and dumping it on the top. We call that spoil. So yes, there was land there. It wasn't just a spoil island. Sampson's Island was already there, but they, they added to it, which is why on Sampson's Island is one of the taller points in the city, quote unquote. And we move forward and we see that that area that flats area that I mentioned in 2007, this is a nice seagrass map that was provided uh, by the county. And that whole area was seagrasses. So you have about a, a, a 32 acre nature preserve and about a 32 acres of seagrasses. Predominantly um, the Halidouli, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the varieties were uh, at the time, but those were uh, seagrass flats for a long, long time. This is up until 2007, so just before the major bloom in 2010 and again in 2016, there were seagrasses on site. So, you know, historically this area did provide habitat for seagrasses. And you can see kind of along the coastline there where we've selected our project site. Uh, we zoom in a little bit and we can see more of this buffered area. So the flats, the light penetration is there. So you have light you have decent water quality. The visibility is good for most of the year. Uh, during the summer right now, it's a little bit less, a little more turbidity. Um, however, this was the original project design. So we created these gray areas, these oyster breakwaters with oyster shell. Now oyster shell, of course, uh, is predominantly in plastic mesh bags. That's the standard restoration technique and has been for a, a while now. But we also tried other materials, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But for the sake of this beginning, we're just going to talk about the design. So each of these breakwaters are 75 feet long, roughly three to three and a half feet tall. The clam bags there, those were the sample bags, and the again, the light uh, pinkish color, that's your clam color. 
Uh, that's where the clam nets were placed from UF, UF Whitney Lab, our partners at UF Whitney were Todd Osborne. Um, Todd has done a great job of coming back to the site, giving us more clams. And at this point in phase one, we did a little over 36,000 clams. The green transects that run north and south are two different colors because they're two different partners. They have Florida Atlantic University on the northern portion. There's five of those transects. And that team was led by Dennis Hanasak. And Dennis, again, all these partners, I absolutely love every one of them. They've been fantastic to work with. Um, they've taught me a lot. I've learned so much over the past you know, three, four years we've been working on this. And their methodologies are different between FAU and FOS. So Dennis at FAU has planted with staples. So these are bamboo skewers that act as staples to hold in the individual rhizomes with the shoots. So you have rhizomes and shoots. And then uh, on the lower portion on the south side, those neon green ones, those are Florida Oceanographic Society transects. Each of the transects from both partners are about the same size, about uh, 30 meters, about 100 feet. And the difference is, is that the FOS seagrass transects, they are actually burlap mats, woven burlap mats. And there's um, groupings of burlap mats woven by volunteers with seagrasses woven into them using this uh, kind of metal, uh, metal strands to weave them into the burlap mats. And then those are all placed together. So there's four by four burlap mats and they're about a half meter uh, once they're all put in place overall. It's about 16 um, by 16 and then taking up a total of a half meter square for each of those. Now, the difference is, is that those burlap mats versus those stapled plugs, we wanted to tell, you know, which methodology is gonna be better. So we had to test that out. We're testing it in a similar area. So they're right next to each other. And the question also was, you know, will the clams help? So clams naturally will help filter water like oysters do, trying to get some of those sulfides out of the water because sulfides are detrimental to seagrasses. Now, it's difficult to determine you know, how much sulfide is in the water. That's why FIT and Dr. Austin Fox has been involved to help us out with our water quality monitoring. Um, so I've mentioned most of our partners. I did not mention Marine Discovery Center in the north who provided uh, a lot of our oyster shell. Um, they came down and they deployed early July of 2021. And so did FOS. So FOS also did seagrasses and oyster shell. So them together creating those typically mm, one foot long by six inches wide oyster shell bags in the black plastic mesh were the dominant oyster bags for most of the project. However, the top two transects are where we tried different materials. We tried a um, galvanized hot dipped uh, steel where we made what's called gabions. And I'll show you pictures of those in a minute. We did pillows also. And um, in phase three, three, we've added prisms, which is a new UF technology from Mark Clark. So there's phase one's map. Here's phase two. It's a little different. Uh, the same transects. Uh, we had a larger bivory event that happened in phase one where the pillows had uh, degraded in material and they, they were uh, pushed over. We can't say by what. No one was on site to, to know that. That's why in phase two, we put up cameras. Uh, but the possibilities are, you know, it could have been a boat that hit the project site. It could have been people messing with it. It could have been a manatee. Regardless, something happened to the structural integrity of that northern oyster breakwater and something got in, um, whether it was turtles or manatees. Um, it decimated the, the seagrass on site and brought our total seagrass coverage down to a little bit below 10%. And uh, the surviving seagrasses are actually denoted in phase two, they're just offset on the third uh, transect going from east to west. Uh, so this time we took a bit away with the clams under the nylon nets. So instead of two areas, we did a broadcast and we just broadcast the clams on site. Again, another uh, 38,000 clams or so. And then Todd's come back once or twice. So we say that as of phase two, we've deployed over 80,000 clams on site and we've planted uh, about 13,500 in phase one and 13,500 seagrasses in phase two to replace those that were uh, predated on through a bivory. Uh, other than that, we have these red dashes here that represent the oyster breakwaters. We split our oyster breakwaters into 25 foot sections. We learned a lot of lessons about monitoring the project 
And that was one of the things that we learned was, okay, we need to monitor these using standards and partner standards. So we're gonna break those 75 foot long breakwaters into 25 foot sections so that you can monitor them uh, individually as opposed to these larger uh, 75 foot breakwaters. The little wavy lines represent the FIT water quality monitoring devices, one inside the project site and one outside the project site. We wanna determine is the project actually improving the water quality and clarity on site? Uh, so those were placed inside and outside the site and I'll move on. This was our project site um, before anything was implemented. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to the story map because we tried the link earlier and I, it did not work. So this link here down at the bottom and available on our website uh, is what you can use to go online and check out the story map. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. And I'm going to screen share again. And I'll go to screen one. And Caitlin, please make sure, tell me that I'm screen sharing correctly. I, I believe so. Um, so now everybody can see my, my screen. I'm going to go to the internet. I'm going to jump on to our satellite beach page real quick. If you wanted to view it, basically, this is what you do. You go to satellitebeach.org. You go down to our sustainable satellite page and click on sustainability at the city it's in two locations there click on that and that will take you right to sustainability at the city and scroll down to our simpsons island submerged lands restoration page we've recently redone the website so a lot of things still have to be updated and added but we made sure that we added this one first because we knew we we're going to be talking about it with you folks so under more info the story map is right there you can also join and volunteer for the project for the monitoring uh, so I welcome everyone to click that button as well. But I'm going to click on our story map through ArcGIS, which was done with our partners from the Eastern Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Big thanks to them for making this possible. Uh, Caitlin, can you just confirm that everybody can see the story map? Is that, is that what everyone's looking at? Yep, you are all good. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through this for you folks and kind of walk you through this. This focuses on phase one. Phase one, we got our funding from the Indian Lagoon National Estuary Program. Big thanks to the IRL NEP, Dwayne DeFries, uh, and the whole team over there. Um, they've been just wonderful to work with, uh, as well the permitting agencies also. So we received some funding. Well, our match was more than our funding. Our match comes from our partners and from volunteers like you. Uh, and one of those partners was the Regional Planning Council. My friend who's a pilot took this and I thought this would be a nice one to kind of showcase the lagoon view. Um, so there's our Indian River Lagoon. At one time, historically the most diverse, one of the most biologically diverse estuaries, lagoon ecosystems in the world. However, not so much right now. We're trying to get it back to that status. So here's all of our partners. Of course, we thank them and you can click on any of the links to their websites and what their related activity was. MRC was involved through volunteer outreach. I want to thank everybody there for coming out. Here's a few of our partners on the boat. Uh, Todd Osborne from UF is driving. Larray Simpson from FOS over here with her team, uh, myself and a few other individuals. We all, um, you know, we worked together for the past few years. So it's, it's really been wonderful working with these people over and over again in phase two and hopefully again in phase three. So here's a nice historical slide we have. So that shot I showed you earlier overlaid with the current area. You can really see the difference in the location and the project location is right up here. That's where our project is. And you can see how built out our city is and how that Grand Canal was constructed right here. So we talk about the history of pre-development um, and then we move a little bit more into the 90s. Um, I think what I'm gonna do actually is update this, did a little research and we have a wonderful video on our city page that talks about the first phase of restoration of Samson's Island in the 90s, where they restored the whole island, got rid of the invasive species, planted grasses, planted mangroves, created a beautiful flats area. And um, eventually that mangrove ecosystem was born out of what was planted there in 94 and 95. Uh, so big thanks to all those people that did that hard work before we ever got involved. Um, so I'm probably gonna add that in over here. But we talked a little bit about the, you know, the seagrass loss of over almost 40,000 acres, which impacted the lagoon dramatically, causing the 
super blooms and the die off of the seagrasses, which is why we're here today trying to learn about new restoration methods. And that was the focus of phase one, was to determine the feasibility of these various restoration techniques to see can they be implemented in this specific location uh, in the lagoon and other locations as well. Uh, big thanks to all the other projects going on through the county and through different cities. It's really wonderful to be part of this push of restoration. And I know there's probably a better word than restoration because restoration doesn't exactly define what we're doing. Um, we are creating new habitat to replace old habitat and it's not exactly the same. So technically we're not restoring, but it's the closest word that we can use. So please forgive me um, as that's the word I'm gonna to choose to use for the points of this talk today. Um, so we talked a lot about this today. We use this aerial as a great example because it just kind of showcases the clam beds, the seagrass transects and the oyster breakwaters. Now, again, it was a phased approach. So first we built our oyster breakwaters on site, wanting to reduce that wave energy, making sure that the site was stable. Uh, we wanted to create an area where the seagrasses could be planted and not predated on. So that was the main focus of, of the first implementation of the oyster breakwaters. And again, that mutualistic relationship is something that we talk about between the clams, oysters, and the seagrasses, because historically in the lagoon, we know that these types of um, habitats are overlapping. It's never just one or the other. They, they come in through phases. When the salinity is higher in the ecosystem, one will become dominant. Uh, when there's you know, a, a wider variety of, oh, we got a raised hand in here. Uh, I think I'll take all questions in a, in a minute after I get through this. So we'll get to you in just a second. Thank you, Kristen. Um, but so finding um, what this ecosystem can support right now is important because it's always shifting and changing as to what can be the dominant species. And currently right now, uh, we have more of a, a macroalgae system and there's calerpa everywhere. We got lots of calerpa. So those dark spots that you see are calerpa, which is a drift algae, which historically doesn't have a high nutrient content, which is why manatees tend not to eat it. Um, so we are, we are noticing these things on site as we're creating the project and we're documenting them as we go. And then we began with, like I said, the oyster restoration of the breakwaters, lots of volunteers on site. Again, this habitat mosaic concept was something that all the partners were really excited about and hopefully we'll start to see more of. And again, thank you to our city council and city manager for approving the project. Uh, my boss at the time was out there with me surveying it before we did it. So we did have some delays in 2020 due to COVID um, and we just kind of had to take a break. It was, it was unfortunate, uh, but we got back to it. We were outside and we were being as cautious as possible, um, but we began with these oyster breakwaters. So once those were uh, put in place, we had a, a stable location. Uh, we did do water quality, like I mentioned. So we were looking for, you know, you're told dissolved nitrogen, you're told dissolved phosphorus, um, and we, we did notice in these four samplings that were done by FIT in phase one, that we had reductions in some and you know um, accumulations in others. But total dissolved nitrogen did drop when we look at the 94, that was in February versus June. Now, what we really learned from this is that we need more data. We just don't have enough data. We need more of it. So that's really what we're wanting to do in phase two and hopefully phase three is collect more data to create a better picture because the snapshot that we got is good. It gives us an idea, but it is not enough to create you know, some really sound science. So we're looking at more data in phases two and three, getting the community involved in that. And we did that again through phase one with the plantings. Thank you to all these volunteers. And this barge over here was from Waterfront Solutions who volunteered their time in phase one and phase two for over, I think between the two phases, at least $15,000 of time and, and effort, um, just amazing amount of support from the community. Uh, we talk in detail about the oyster bags at this point. So here's the bags I mentioned, this is the plastic mesh. We also, again, the galvanized steel, one inch to make gabions. Uh, there's different methods to make gabions or gabions, depending on how you wanna pronounce it. Uh, but we would use a concrete block and create a framework and then put lids on the top and bottom, making it easier to monitor them by just opening up the lids. Uh, the seagrass plantings, again, we have the plugs woven into the burlap mats, over a thousand mats from FOS, so 1,000 mats from FOS, 
with 10 to 16 separate plugs puts us at a little over 10 to 15,000 individual seagrasses. Um, and this is what they look like. So there we go. Again, thanks to Lorraine and her team. Um, just really wonderful folks over there at FOS to work with. So there's our mats held down with bamboo skewers for phase one. And in phase two, they expanded that to include seven different types of methods of holding down the burlap mats. Uh, you may have seen this picture throughout the restoration community. This is the clam photo where we had a wonderful group join uh, Todd Osborne and his team from UF. And those are all little clams. Well, not little, those are the bigger clams. There's two sizes of clams that were used in the restoration. Uh, one of them was about two inches to three inches, depending on the size of the clam. Um, and one of them was smaller, about a half inch. All these grown in the UF Whitney labs. And again, like there we go, 38,000. So these are the smaller ones. And you can see some of those are, are definitely the bigger ones. And they were just dispersed on site and then covered with these nylon nets. However, we learned from phase one that the nylon nets were definitely limiting the mobility of the clams, as well as keeping them in a, one location where we, we noticed crown conch as being a really heavy predator on the clams. Um, and we didn't realize at first how many were on site and maybe they were drawn there, uh, but we have a huge crown conch problem on site right now. So we're always trying to get them off site and relocate them to a different location. Um, so the mapping specifically done by um, myself and the Eastern Central Florida Regional Planning Council, we came up with a really nice map where these are all clickable points. So as we do restoration, we'll be able to go in and actually update you, the community, as to what is happening at each of these points. Uh, and this was from phase one. So this is the phase one map. Unfortunately, um, most of them were predated on and that herbivory event took out most of them except for these right here. And in phase two, the next map will have them offset. Um, these clam locations, again, have changed from phase one to phase two. So we're still in phase two, and then you're seeing the results from phase one, and you will see in the near future the updates from phase two being implemented. So phase one, big thanks to the National Estuary Program, the IRL NEP, and in phase two, it's the Tourism Development Council from Bavard County, the, the Beach Committee, who approved funding for phase two to do it again. So without these funding sources, projects like this wouldn't happen. So I really wanna thank them and all the partners. And at this point, um, we'll take a little break for questions and then we'll come back and play a video. So I'm gonna go ahead into chat. Um, oh, so that's just from MRC, please why our questions in the Q and the A. And we got Michael, how does this project handle the dramatic increase in temperatures all across the board? Uh, does this affect monitoring and sea gas population? So um, good question, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer that live. One of those lessons we learned from phase one that was, yes, indeed, the, the project site is warmer inside the area where we have the oyster breakwaters. So part of changing the length of the oyster breakwaters from 75 feet to 25 feet was to increase flow on site. Increasing flow reduces temperature, which is nice. Um, it also reduces the amount of sediment accumulation because we were definitely seeing at least an inch of sediment accumulating within the project site, which that combined with the nylon netting was really pushing those clams down to a point where they couldn't put their little feeders up and, and survive. Um, so that was an issue. So that was one of the ways that we addressed the issue of increased heat on site by increasing the breakwaters and increasing flow. Now, um, across the board, we still see seagrasses uh, surviving and thriving inside the project site in phase two. Um, again, they were planted a little over two months ago and they're looking really good right now. Some predation from pinfish, but overall healthy seagrasses. Um, so the heat isn't hurting them right now. We'll keep an eye on that. Maybe we'll keep an extra eye on that. Thanks to you, Mike, for reminding me. Um, and I'll just kind of keep an extra eye on that, but nothing detrimental on our project site right now due to the increased heat uh, in the lagoon. Um, so. So far, so good. Uh, that was our one Q&A question. And we're gonna move on to- uh, Q&A questions come in from um, email. Did you want us to go over those now or did you wanna take those at the end? Um, how much more time do we have left? We are good on time right now, so up to you. Okay, let's take a minute. I'm gonna give myself a break. I'm gonna drink a little glass of water and play this video. Let me know if this okay. video plays. 
the San Jacinto Valley Submerged Lands Restoration Project in the city of Satellite Beach. And this project oh was created by the city of Satellite Beach to test new techniques with project partners. We created a habitat. Are you seeing the video? Uh, it's looking like the video might, might be playing on a different one of your screens. The relationships that they have. Mm. For example, so you the grasses right themselves are vulnerable to sulfide. But the clams filter them out of the water. All right. So by planting them together, we reduce the likelihood that seagrasses will be impacted by additional sulfur. So this was a video created from our partners at Balance for Earth. And I'm just gonna kind of stop at a few spots here so everybody can kind of see. So there's our seagrasses. These were the ones planted uh, by FAU. You could tell that those were uh, not the burlap mats, those are the ones on the, the plugs and the staples, bamboo staples, the skewers. Here's our project site and a little bit more. Oh, here's a fun one. So as well, the nutrients that lead to algae blooms. By reducing those nutrients, we reduce I'll just let it play. algae blooms at the site, which allows for better light penetration, which is vital to seagrass restoration. This project was funded by the National Estuary Program and 10 project partners. We used 30 tons of repurposed oyster shell to create the oyster breakwaters and planted 13,500 seagrass plugs and deployed 42,000 plants. The San Francisco Submerged Land Restoration Project took seven weeks to complete and engaged 279 community volunteers for a total of 1,374 volunteer hours worth over $30,000 in volunteer time. As part of the project, city council members from the city of Satellite Beach came out to join us for deployment days and monitoring. I wanna thank all of our city council members and our members of the sustainability board, our city manager for supporting the project, uh, and community members and volunteers and our partners and the National Estuary Program, everyone really pitched in to make this project successful. We hope to see more projects like this in the Indian River Lagoon ecosystem. Thank you for tuning in and learning about the Samson Island Submerged Lands Restoration Project. And I hope that you get out and enjoy the lagoon and the environment in your own backyard, wherever you may live. All right. Okay. So, so there we go. So there's a video at the end of it. We're going to do another video in phase two that gives an update, a little more science in the second one, um, as we've learned a lot, as I mentioned. Um, so that, that video is available at the end of the story map. I'm going to stop sharing the story map right now and jump back to the PowerPoint real quick. Here we go, screen two. All right, how, how's that? Is that uh, sharing that one? Yep, we got you. Perfect, okay, we're getting this, nice. Um, so I'll just click on the, oh boy, where's the, oh, I gotta expand this. I think I gotta expand the, Actual, how do I expand that? Sorry, folks, technical difficulties. I want to get back to the full screen of the Zoom so that I can navigate the PowerPoint. There we go. All right. Um, so this was the, the spot again. Now we talk about project implementation. So we did create these flyers. You may have seen these around the community, and you'll see more of these uh, at events as well. We always have our Earth Day event in the city of Satellite Beach where we promoted the project, uh, events like this, Lunch and Learn, uh, also the Indian River Lagoon Day, which is a partnered event at Front Street Park, which happens every year. I hope you all attend that. And uh, we've been using QR codes. It's really a great way to get people involved and it's easy. Um, this is my friend Adam from the zoo. Um, of course, the zoo's doing a lot of great things as well. Big shout out to all their, their success. Um, on the sign here, this is the main sign of the project site. So there's a piling that thanks our partners. And we have a FWC um, manatee sign as well as part of our permits. So here are those gabions. So right now in phase two, we have 100 gabions, 40 prisms. These are the prisms, concrete jute fabric laid over a mold with oyster shell inside. They're very heavy. Uh, MRC has some of these as well. Uh, here's one of our all-star volunteers, Jackson, who's been involved in almost every volunteer day. Uh, he's been a really, really great helper and great volunteer. So those are the prisms stacked in the water there. 
Uh, we have, like I said, 40 of them, and they're stacked three on the bottom, one on the top. That was the location where the herbivory break was in year one. So we wanted to really make sure it was strong in phase two. Here's a nice shot of all of our oyster bags, some of the pillows as well, uh, down there in the bottom and in the back. So again, at this point, it's over 50 tons of oyster shell, uh, 5,500 bags and 500 pillows, and then 40 gabions, no, 100 gabions and 40 prisms. Uh, this is Waterfront Solutions. They're helping us out. We would load them up on this uh, seawall here at Chevy Chase, take them into the project site. Uh, in phase one, we actually use the clubhouse at Tortoise Island. Uh, and here we got our recreation director, um, Cassie and volunteer coordinator, Anna, helping us out. So city staff was involved. This was a nice shot of the island with Dr. Fox coming out to do the water quality monitoring. Saw that one. Again, just a lot of shots of all the volunteers. Really want to thank them. Uh, we have Vivian Maine from FOS. Uh, I see Sarah and Morgan from FOS, as well as other partners as well, uh, coming out to help us. Big thanks to the team from FOS doing both the seagrasses and the oysters. Here are those mats. And then you can see these darker squares. Those are the oyster mats in the FOS section. Again, there's that clam shot from the video. And uh, you can see how, you know, 42,000 in phase one and 80,000 clams overall is really easy to get to when they're that size. Some of the bigger ones, uh, like I said, are about two to three inches. And big thanks to Todd and the team from UF Whitney Lab for making that possible. Uh, we do have those eco tours that I mentioned. So uh, right here, we had an eco tour just the other day with Dwayne DeFries from the IRL NEP coming out. Uh, big thanks to, the, again, the IRL NEP for that funding in phase one. On the boat is Courtney Barker, our city manager, who has supported the project and given great advice on, on how to move forward with it in phases one, two, and hopefully in phase three. We also had Wesley Brooks, the chief resilience officer, come and visit us and take a look at the project, as well as the dredging going on in the canal adjacent to the project as well. Um, I think Dwayne wanted to kind of show him an example of lagoon restoration in progress. And you got a great shot of the project behind us. Uh, Kate Helms is our water, a uh, storm water manager. She's also on the boat as well. And behind is myself and uh, Thea Barker, uh, Baker. Uh, Thea is our sustainability and planning um, director, and I'm your environmental programs coordinator. So a lot of city staff supporting the project and talking about it with Dwayne and Wesley on this particular eco tour. Uh, typically, the eco tours will go to Sampson's Island and you may see some wildlife there. We do have our three docks and we invite everyone to come out on Sundays, uh, currently Sundays, first Sunday of the month at one to visit for that. You can sign up online through the recreation page on the city website. You can also sign up for community service. So um, community science is a way to do community service. We call it community science these days. It used to be called citizen science, but I think that's just to be more inclusive. Uh, in this photo, you have uh, myself and some volunteers using the quadrats to sample to do percent coverage of seagrasses. And we've actually changed a little bit of this methodology as to get better data. Uh, we're gonna, these are one meter quadrats and row of 10 by 10. And what we're doing is we're gonna adjust that to be half meter quadrats. Cause as I mentioned, the planting units of those actual um, seagrass planted burlap mats is a half meter. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring that growth and that success first before we start measuring what grows outside of that. Otherwise, you know, if you had 100% growth of those mats uh, and, and growth inside of every one of those squares, it would still only read 50% of a one meter quadrat. So making sure that, that that science and that data collection is standardized is something that we're working on in the monitoring plan right now. And that's one thing that's going to come out of this uh, as we move forward is project monitoring standardizing throughout uh, hopefully the lagoon because we have all these projects going on in the lagoon and Sampson's Island Submerged Lands Restoration is one of them. So we wanna make sure that we're talking in the same language, using the same nomenclature and communicating the same methodologies across the board. Uh, so that's something that we you know really learned from phase one to phase two and, and in phase three, we plan to implement uh, in better detail. Uh, so this was a nice picture of FOS, you got Larray right there. Uh, so again, Citizen science, one aspect, uh, community science. 
So getting those individuals like yourselves out in the community to learn the process of scientific monitoring, what it entails, and actually conduct some of that, looking at the oyster bags, looking at the seagrasses, uh, in addition to the scientific monitoring from the partners. That happens quarterly, whereas the city monitoring is another layer. So we have three layers of monitoring that are happening on the project site, really wanting to get good data. Uh, these were the first oysters that we found on site. We were out there the other day, we sampled uh, a bag and a half, there was a broken bag and a full bag, and we had 10 live oysters in just that one and a half bag uh, that we sampled from. Uh, the bags were replaced with fresh bags and put back in their location. Uh, these, again, these are the oysters that you would typically see in the lagoon growing off of the shells of other oysters, which is how that works. We did not see the project site with any oyster spat. These are all oysters that um, were on site, that had spat land on them that grew oysters. We are obviously very excited here on day one. Uh, on the left, Vivian Maine, in the middle, myself, and Larray Simpson uh, from FOS. Here's Dr. Fox doing a little water quality monitoring on site. Um, sometimes we got to remove some debris, got some debris logs there, but we're putting in our, our water quality monitoring stations, again, inside and outside the site. Another shot of some oysters growing inside the bag uh, and on the bag itself or uh, on the shell. Here we have the team from FOS actually creating a baseline of where the uh, oyster breakwaters are using laser levels. Uh, we have Richard from FAU, Florida Atlantic University, uh, doing some of his monitoring. And you can see he has that larger one meter by one meter quadrat. However, they also have uh, specific locations within the quadrat that they're taking uh, for shoot heights. Uh, and there's our project site as it looks uh, at the end of phase one. We'll get you an updated photo of phase two here shortly. And this is the updated map. So you're the first folks to see this. This is the first uh, map of phase two versus phase one. We have all the seagrass transects from um, FOS. We need to go back and get the ones from FAU. So almost finished, not quite done with this update. Once that's updated, that'll go on the website. Uh, we have this location here where there's a little bit of a cage. We're testing out cages. Uh, the cages of the seagrasses aren't working as well as we might have hoped. Uh, they're trapping a little bit more uh, drift algae, calerpa, and uh, there's a little bit of actual muck accumulation inside the cage. Uh, so these larger corral kind of methodology of having the uh, oyster breakwaters on the outside seems to be working much better. And big thanks again to all of our project partners, funding agencies, community volunteers, and of course, uh, City of Satellite Beach City Council, City Manager, and staff for all the help and support in making this happen. Here's a few of our partners when we were at the IRL Symposium. Um, this took me 40 minutes and the symposium gave me three minutes. So I'm really happy that we had this opportunity, thanks to the MRC, to do this and to talk to you folks about the project. Uh, again, thanks to all of our partners, thanks to the MRC. And uh, with that, if you need any questions, please feel free to email me, contact me, let me know uh, if you wanna be involved, if you have thoughts, questions, comments, recommendations, way to improve. And with that, I'll end the stop and share uh, make sure everybody gets an extra minute. Again, that's N-S-A-N-Z-O-N-E at satellitebeach.org. Please visit our city website and check out the story map, check out the video, check out the links to volunteering through the rec page. And uh, yeah, at this point, uh, we'll take any questions about the project. Thanks so much, Nick. That was a fabulous presentation. It was really awesome to be able to sort of see a little bit more in depth what's going on with your Fancy's Island project. Um, so we did have some additional uh, questions come in through email. Um, so the first one is where did the donor seagrass come from? Great question. Uh, so both uh, Florida Atlantic and Florida Oceanographic Society are growing seagrasses in tanks. And I'd be probably a good idea. I'll get some photos from them to add to the slides but uh, right behind me we got our seagrass types uh, and we are growing the haladuli variety um, so that's your shoal grass and it's grown in tanks um, it's harvested from uh, lagoon um, i think they what do they they call them um, fragments right so these fragments of seagrasses float along different sections of the lagoon 
they then are harvested, collected, because otherwise they would probably die, right? They get washed up in a tide and they, they're not rooted anymore. They may have been uprooted by uh, herbivory or maybe a overly zealous uh, stingray or horseshoe crab that's rooting around for other things. And those fragments float off. They're collected by these teams of very experienced environmental scientists who grow them in tanks. So they're, they're grown in tanks. Um, some of them actually, I think from FAU came from a location just north of us where they were planted and grown in the lagoon and then harvested from there. But originally they came from tanks from FAU and FOS. That's really cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, what was the total cost of phase one? Okay, so phase one, I had that on there. Uh, it was, again, it's on that story map, 64,500 was requested from the city and we provided them 70,000 something in match. Um, so that was for phase one. Uh, phase two, actually, let me, I actually, I pulled this up earlier because I knew that question would come up. I have both detailed budgets uh, just in case uh, to make sure that I could look at that because um, I want to get those numbers right. Cause I know that that matters. That matters to folks. Uh, we did generate over $54,000 in volunteer hours from phase one. And um, we're, we're on our way in phase two, but we need more. Uh, we need more volunteer hours in phase two to kind of get to that number. Um, phase two, we went to the TDC and that's seven, 117,000 request, 123,500 uh, in the actual uh, funding amount. So, uh, so there's the match amount, right, that we're providing. That's the 123.5, and then there's the amount that we're requesting for reimbursement. That's the 117, and that comes from our project partners for the most part. It's staff time, it's uh, project partners, staff time, and some materials costs. And the partners have been really good about splitting those costs pretty much down the middle, uh, for the most part. You know, if they want to get um, six thousand dollars they'll usually put up six thousand dollars or or something close to that um, and then for phase one just to make sure that i got that number right detailed budget table amendment i'm clicking in my word documents and uh, my computer's a little slow because i have too many tabs open as most of you at home probably uh, can sympathize and empathize with yep right there with you <laughs> So that's the 117. I don't need that one anymore. And then there we go. Um, so yeah, the, the numbers that I mentioned earlier were correct from the actual story map. So there you go. Uh, what was our next question? Um, the next question was, I guess, sort of the question was, will there be a competitive bid process for phase two? But it sounds more like maybe it should be, was there a competitive bid process for phase two? Was there a public bid process? A uh, competitive bid process. So I competitive guess. bid pro process. Um, I don't, I guess I, I, that's a tough one to, to kind of ask because it was from partners. So all the work was done by project partners. Um, I guess if we had something that we had to go out for bid for, it would have been competitive because that's the city standard. Um, but nothing was above that, that marker that says that you have to go out to bid. Um, it was all partners you know, being involved from phase one to phase two and hopefully in phase three. And yeah, they were all underneath the threshold for that. So it wasn't like a bid for services that had to go out. Um, it was just the accumulation of all those partners individually makes it a higher number. But because of those were individuals, you know, we weren't told that we had to go to, out to bid for anything. Okay, great. And then while we're asking this last question that I have here, just a reminder to everybody that if you would like to add one more question, head on over to the Q&A right now. Mm -hmm. um, the last question that I have here in front of me is how are you selecting project partners and is there availability to add partners? Always, always interested in more project partners. Um, like I said, some people uh, like Waterfront Solutions, they weren't a project partner, but they wanted to be involved and they just donated their time. I mean, it was amazing that, to have them just kind of hear about the project, give us a call, see if they could be involved and make it happen. Um, you know, if you have um, a company or something like that, you know, please reach out. Um, we, you know, we, we look forward to collaborating with as many people as possible because that's how we learn and improve. And, you know, that's how we create this kind of more standard methodology, which again was the goal of the project to determine the feasibility of 
sorry, let me try that again, to determine the feasibility of implementing various restoration techniques in the lagoon, right? So uh, most of them were feasible, you know, for the most part, but there's limiting factors, sometimes external forces of uh, natural predation, you know, that happens. Uh, that's part of it. That's part of the process. So in my book, and I hope that in, in most other people's eyes, the project was a huge success because we learned so much and that was the goal. So we determined that, um, yes, it is feasible to restore seagrasses in the lagoon, specifically in this area. We determined that, yes, it is feasible to do oyster restoration because we had spat accumulate on oyster shell. Now, we didn't achieve the exact goals that we set forward for um, in the phase one, it was 10% uh, of oyster shell will have spat settlement on it or something along those lines is the exact language. That was very ambitious. Now, I didn't monitor enough to be able to determine that. We would have needed to monitor more because, I mean, 30,000 tons of shell in phase one is a lot to monitor. Um, now, I was monitoring it under the uh, presence and absence you know, is there oysters there? Is there not oysters there? Is there seagrasses surviving? Is there not seagrasses surviving? But in phase two, you know, all the partners came back and the NEP came back and they gave us good recommendations to say, we need more defined monitoring. We need to know exactly what you're asking, what your methods are, what your metrics are. We want that in writing so that we can talk about that and improve on that. Because in phase one, you didn't really have anything more than just presence and absence. You know, water quality monitoring is a little bit more detailed because, you know, you kind of have to, but just are the clams on site surviving? You know, we're, we're going out and we're pulling up those four bags and we're looking at survivorship. Now, clams didn't do so well. Is it feasible? Yeah, it's feasible. Is it as successful as you might want it to be? Every location is going to be different. Um, salinity has a big role to play in that. Predation has a bigger role to play in that than we would have ever thought. The amount of crown conch on site, I can't express this enough. Every time we go on site, these little crown conch are just eating our clams every time. I, I mean, I have more pictures I'll, I'll um, you know, add to the story map as we do in phase two, but like there's crown conch eating, crown, eating the, the clam like on it, like actually on it. I got a picture of one in the process of eating it. Um, so, you know, it's good to have these larger goals you want to have standard metrics of success and, and monitoring needs to have that. So those were one of the things we began implementing in phase two. And we have this wonderful monitoring plan that's being reviewed by, um, you know, these different agencies and these bodies that we plan to implement in phase three, hopefully when we get funding from the TDC, uh, we currently are, I uh, have applied for additional funding for monitoring, additional funding for the eco tours to increase the, uh, the volume of them and the frequency of them and to continue this citizen community science monitoring to get people engaged and involved because I think I'll, I'll end it with a quote from the video that was made in 1994 that again is available on our, our city website on the rec department page under Sampson's Island. This one, this one gentleman said it's the direct, I'm paraphrasing, but it's the direct felt experience of projects like this. And in that case, he was referencing the restoration of Sampson's Island, but it's the direct felt experience of projects like this that make a lasting impression on future generations. And it's getting those future generations involved that's gonna, you know, pass the torch. And it's, you know, we've all said this and heard this a million times. It, it's, it's applicable to restoration as it's applicable to life in general. It's a marathon, not a sprint, you've probably heard. But I like to say that it's a relay race because it's not just a marathon, it's a relay race. You're always passing that torch off, that, that baton to the next generation. And the better we get at this process of understanding the metrics of success, having monitoring plans, and learning what methodologies work, the better we are at setting them up for success in the future. So that's that idea of it's, it's a relay race. And we were just born into it. So we get the privilege and you know the honor of being involved uh, thanks to all the project partners and the city council and the funding agencies and folks like you. So, so thanks again uh, to everybody involved. And I really hope to see you out there either involved in our project or the zoos project or the county projects or any way, shape or form in the different, uh, you know, restoration going on and with what the MRC is doing.
um, you know, keep, keep it up MRC. You guys are doing great. I love to see the summer camps and the mangrove uh, potting growing uh, happening. So uh, thanks again to everybody. Feel free to reach out, shoot me an email, uh, find us on Facebook. Our Facebook page for our sustainability board is where we post a lot of these types of updates. Uh, that's gogreensb.org. And that's Sustainable Satellite on Facebook. And uh, thanks again. So so nice to be here. Thank you so much, Nick. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, again, if you guys wanted to get involved with this project, your volunteer link was on your website. Sounds absolutely amazing. So go check that out. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. All right.